Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we are reviewing Freakonomics by Stephen Levitt and Stephen Dubstep Dubner. The hidden side of everything. Is that what they call him? That's what they call him. <laughs> that's what they call him. So that's uh, you know Adam and Adam reviewing Stephen and Stephen. Uh, this is a very, very popular book from the uh, early 2000s, 2005. They had a whole bunch of spin-off books, Super Freakonomics, Think Like a Freak, How to Rob a Bank, and a very, very popular podcast. And so what they are, Stephen Levitt is an economist and a professor, and Stephen Dubner, I believe, was a, a journalist before. So they've sort of combined the high-level academic with a bit of real world for the general public to understand. Yeah, absolutely. So hitting it from that two angles, you really get a good understanding of economics and, and how it really incentivizes us in our everyday behavior. Because economics really, at the root, it is the study of incentives. So it's about how people get what they want or need. So for economics, we work and we trade a lot of our time because we're incentivized to get money to be actually trade it for what we want. But it also happens in the you know the behavioral domain as well. Yeah, we're always responding to incentives. You know, if, uh, when you're a kid, if you're a toddler, you reach up, you touch the stove, you burn your finger, so you realize that you're not going to touch that again. Or if you do really well at school and you get a good report, and then your parents go and get you a new bike. So there's incentives there both uh, natural and also set up, you know, whether that's a a parent, an economist, a politician, we're setting up, or you're obviously a boss, we're setting up these incentives to try to get people to do more good things and less bad things. So as you said, when they don't come organically, someone has to invent them. So, you know, your parents might offer their kids a trip to the toy store to buy them the latest Buzz Lightyear toy uh, as a bribe to make them eat more vegetables. Or a company is actually whacked with a fine if they do the wrong thing against the shareholder's best interests, uh, and having that, you know, that that stick of the fine there, hoping that companies will actually work better in the future. Yeah. So some of the things we're going to cover uh, in this episode about free economics is uh, about moral incentives versus economic incentives. We're going to talk about information asymmetry. We're going to talk about the difference between correlation and causation. And we're going to talk about how us as humans are really bad at, uh, at assessing risks. Yeah, we suck at it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we suck at a lot of things the more you dig into yeah, behavioral definitely. economics. And the first thing we really suck at, in a way, is uh, when it comes to moral incentives versus economic incentives. And he hits us with the story of Israeli daycare centers at the, at the start. So there was uh, a whole bunch of Israeli daycare centers. Obviously, you take your kids... Um, for the day, you go to work and then you come back and pick your kids up. And the Israeli daycare centers, uh, they want to get rid of the kids at the, yeah. end, at the end of the day. But they found that there was a, a lot of parents coming late. Even though they had a clearly stated policy, kids have to be picked up by 4 p.m., parents were often late. And obviously, that resulted in a lot of upset, crying kids. And it also meant that one of the teachers had to stay back extra until all the kids were gone. And so, a pair of economists thought, okay, we can reduce the tardiness here uh, by increasing an incentive. And so, what they thought is if we introduce a fine for anyone picking up uh, their kids late, that will mean the parents become more vigilant and then they come and pick them up on time. So, what they did was they did a a test of four weeks and just no change. And they found that on average, there were eight late pickups per week. And then what they did, they thought, okay, let's introduce a $3 fine. So every time you're late, you get whacked with a $3 fine. And they thought, okay, by having this fine, parents are going to come on time. But actually, the amount of lateness actually went up. So what they failed to recognize here, there was two incentives involved for the parents. One is the economic incentive, which they thought that the parents were going to act upon, right? So if they were late, it's going to cost them 3 bucks. But the bigger, more powerful incentive here was the moral incentive for the parents because the the daycare workers, right, they're they're on minimum wage, they're getting paid shit. The the parents actually didn't want to have them waiting back for them. But all of a sudden, when they offered this economic incentive, they thought, all right, it's fine if I pay them three bucks, that means that that worker can stay back and it doesn't really matter. So what they did is they traded that economic incentive incentives to really buy the guilty free conscious of coming back late yeah exactly rather than obviously picking your kids up on time if there's no fine it's just it's the right thing to do whereas if you say okay every time you're late it costs you three bucks and in the grand scheme of things it was really small like the i think the the average monthly bill for daycare was like 380 bucks so a three dollar fine is less than one percent 
of their monthly budget. And if you were late every single day, the most you're going to pay is like 60 bucks. And so it was a very small, like less than a sixth. And all you can say is, okay, well, basically it's like, it's just cheap extra daycare. Rather than being the morally right thing to do of going to pick your kids up on time, because that's the right thing to do. Now it just becomes, okay, well, I can pay an extra extra three bucks and I can come late. So Dan O'Reilly, uh, in his book, In Predictably Irrational, he talked in, in different terms like the social norms versus market norms, which is really basically the same thing. Mm. You know, one example is if you're at your uh, parent, your in-laws for dinner, right? And then they put on this massive, amazing roast and everyone's loving it. And then you pull out your wallet and then offer them 50 bucks for the incredible dinner and uh, yeah. just to, to pay for the great experience that they've given you. But again, that's a, an idea where you're really mixing up these social norms and market norms. Yeah, another yeah, it's very important to keep those distinct and realize when is it a, a social norm or a moral incentive and when is it a market norm or an economic incentive. And what the uh, economists found was they, they completely fucked the whole system because mm. they were like, okay, well, this isn't working. Let's remove the fine. Uh, and when they removed the fine, it, was, it didn't go back to normal because parents are now adjusted to coming late and they couldn't fix it. So um, bad luck for the economists. Mm-hmm. They found a similar thing when it came to blood donations. So in the 1970s, some economists conducted this study. They were trying to find ways to increase blood donations. And they thought that by giving people a small amount of money as just a, you know, a little bonus, thanks for coming along and donating blood, here's, here's a little bit of extra coin in your pocket. They thought that that would increase donations. But of course, they were wrong again because what they've done, they've translated it from a moral incentive to an economic incentive. And, you know, people going to donate blood, really they want to do it because it feels like a good thing to do. They feel like a really good person. They feel like a giving altruistic person by giving up their time and giving up their blood. And then by translating that into money, it just becomes a painful inconvenience to get a few extra bucks. So in both cases, there really is moral incentives and economic incentives. You might think, all right, if we just pumped up the economic incentive hardcore, then maybe they would come in and donate more money uh, right, so if you went from instead of fifty bucks, you offered five hundred or five thousand dollars, the results might be different. You might be getting a lot more blood, but there's always these second order effects when you set up these economic incentives, right? As we're going to see in future stories as well. But say for pints of blood was about five grand, then all of a sudden gangs might start going around robbing people of their blood instead of their wallets because, a, 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 you know, if you get ten liters of blood in someone's body it's worth 50 grand to just go and bring him into your um your back your back dungeon you got in your in your basement and just milk them of all their blood yeah exactly so you you got to be really careful about how you set up these economic incentives and sort of the the same thing goes for the daycare if instead of 3 bucks they said okay we're going to fine you 300 bucks mm. people would start to get really pissed off cuz anytime there might be some kind of innocent mistake or there was some unavoidable thing where once every couple of months they were late by no fault of their own, and then they get whacked with this massive fine, people would start to get pissed off. So it's really a fine balance when you're trying to set up these kind of incentives that you can't go too little or it's ineffective and you can't go too much or you're going to have these second-order consequences as well. So that was the first chapter all about moral incentives versus economic incentives. The second chapter is all about information asymmetry and all about the power that those with more information actually yield when it comes to different transactions. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of uh, exchanges and interactions that involve a lot of information. Like say for example, there's an insurance company, you want to take out life insurance, you have a lot more information about your your health and well-being and your eating and exercise habits than the insurance company could possibly ever know. So you've got a hell of a lot more information there. Or if you go the other way, if you think about a, a car mechanic and you think about your car and me personally, I've got absolutely no idea about what's going on under, under the hood. They've got so much more information that they can really use that against me and say, yeah, your car's fucked. You need to get mm. A, B and C done and it's going to cost you 1500 bucks and I'd yeah. be none the wiser. Yeah, absolutely. So when you, as the buyer, you don't really know what's going down on the, on the seller's side of things, they can actually charge a big premium from that big information gap that they've got. So for example, in the actual 1990s, the price of term life insurance actually fell really dramatically. And at the time, they thought there was no real immediate or direct cause. But if you look back at what happened, it was actually the internet happened. So, Mm. Quotesmith.com was founded and became the first of several websites that enabled customers to compare with seconds uh, all the different uh, life insurance kind of policies. 
So all of a sudden, all that information asymmetry was all disrupted from the, the, the invention of the internet. And this was the same in a whole bunch of different industries. Yeah, as soon as you can quickly know and compare different things, you're starting to get more power and more information. So then the, the people with all the power, uh, with all the information, they're starting to lose their advantage. And rather than them taking you for a ride, you can start to understand it a bit more clearly for yourself. I recently saw the Apple Keynote and Apple, I think the biggest perpetrators when it comes to this. <laughs> if, you, if you just look at, watch this Keynote, it has all of this in, in the one hit. So they have massive information asymmetry on some of their products. Like one of the things they announced was their new Mac Pro, which is a $6,000 beast. And it's you know probably a rip off, but you don't really know because you don't mm. really know what's going down behind this technology. You just assume it's worth $6,000 of all this amazing stuff. So in that sense, they can kind of get away with those kind of products. But then one of the next slides that they shown was the $1,000 stand. And <laughs> like you as a consumer, you, there's no information asymmetry there. You're just looking at it and it's just a stand that moves up and down like all these other stands we know. So we could actually call bullshit because there is no information asymmetry when it comes to something as basic as that. Yeah, man, that's... Uh... That's bizarre. I haven't, I haven't seen it, but I, I, I can't understand how they're possibly justifying the, the value there. Or well, if you think about it, if you go to a, a car mechanics, a very similar thing. It's the information asymmetry that mm. a mechanic just understands everything that's going on in the car. They can pull out absolutely anything they want and you're just going to uh, trust what they're saying and it's, it's the power they yield. Yeah, a big example of this uh, is um, the lemon problem. And this is big. I did economics in... Um, high school and a bit in university and this is like one of the most used examples of this a dude called george akerloff in the 1960s wrote this paper about the market for lemons and basically a a lemon is just a a piece of shit car so if you're selling a second-hand car obviously you've got all the information you know the car's history you know how well it works or you know some of the uh you know some of the things under the hood that aren't going so well whereas the buyer's really got not much idea and the issue here is well because there's so many shit cars that people are trying to sell, the thing is the buyer is only going to pay an average price because they know that most of them are going to be shit and that actually means that anyone who's selling a legit car, so if you buy a car and six months later for whatever reason you want to sell it but it's still perfect, in perfectly good condition, the buyer's suspicious because there's so many shit cars on the market. So you're going to be actually get a, a much worse price where someone with an absolute stinker is actually going to get a better price because we just assume that everything is going to be average. So we average it all out. This lemons problem is the fact that because there's all this information asymmetry, we try to we try to counteract that by just saying, okay, we're just going to pay average. We're going to assume that most stuff is, uh, is a waste of money. So we're just going to go for an average price. So it really screws up the whole secondhand car market and, and basically they're saying that uh, there's really no way around it. One of the stories it talks about in the book is all about real estate agents who really have massive information asymmetry when you're selling your home. Like you assume the real estate agent, you know, they spent their whole career um, working in this area and they know all the, all the what houses are going for in your area and you're only going to sell your house a couple of times in your life. So you mm. put all of your trust into the real estate agent and it might appear that your incentives are completely aligned because for a real estate agent, you know, they get a 1.5% commission so they're incentivized to go out there and maximize the amount that you get for your actual home. Yeah, exactly. You think that, well, if I'm getting more money, they're getting more money, so they're going to want to get the best price possible. But when you really break it down, say it's a, a $300,000 house, they're probably getting something like four and a half grand as their, as their benefit for selling your house. But then if, it, if you think, okay, well, instead of getting 300, I can get 310, you'll think, well, for an extra 10 grand... They're only really getting an extra 150 bucks. And so for all this extra work, maybe it's another two weeks on the market, maybe they've got to pump it a little bit harder. You're thinking, yeah, I get an extra 10 grand in my pocket or almost 10 grand, but they're only getting the extra 150 bucks. So for them, they'd probably rather sell it quickly for like a, a decent offer of 300 grand. They're still getting their four and a half K. For them to work so much harder to get that little bit more, they're only getting a tiny little benefit for themselves. So in that case, if they're selling your house, they're only going to get 150 extra extra bucks for the extra three days' work. So if you dig it a little bit deeper into the details, you look at what real estate agents do when they have all the skin in the game and they're, they're selling their own house. 
And what they found was on average, real estate agents hold their homes for 10 days longer and get a 3% better price because they're capturing that whole 3% when they do that. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty crazy that uh, they they want to sell your house quicker, but when they're selling their own house, they're willing to put in that extra effort. And some of the things that real estate agents use against you is fear because it is a massive transaction, obviously, selling your house. And there's two ways they use the fear. Obviously, for you yourself, you've got the fear of selling it for less than you could have got if you sell it for too low. But also, there's a fear that if you try to sell it for too much, you might not end up selling it at all or it's going to be a long, drawn-out process. And the agents love to prey on this fear. So they think, okay, I've got a good deal here. I want to talk them into selling it. They might tell you the story of the house down the road that's a bit bigger and it's a bit nicer, but it's been stuck on the market for the last six months and the people in there haven't been able to sell it. Mm. So they love, they love to use this information asymmetry to prey on our fear. And what they're using it for is for you to sell it as quickly as they can. So they're putting in as little effort to get as much profit as they possibly can. And it makes sense for them. Yeah, If they can sell your house, move on to the next one, which they're going to get four and a half grand mm. for rather than sitting on yours for that extra squeeze to try and, try and get that extra little tiny bit of juice out there, it's really not worth it for them. Well, if you look at it as a just purely dollar per hour, what they're mm-hmm. going to be earning, right? The, if you look at it at the surface, you just look at the dollar value, but if it's per hour, mm. uh, they are quicker to put that fear in, inside the, the seller as much as they can just so they're incentivized to just get rid of it as, quick as quickly as they can. Yeah, exactly. So there is proven power when it comes to information asymmetry and you can put a price premium on things when you have the information asymmetry. But, but again, like the insurance and the car salesman and a lot of restaurants out there, the internet is actually eroding this information and uh, asymmetry and the advantage of those who are selling. What they found was that since the since the internet and the real estate.com kind of uh, sites of the world, that the difference between what real estate agents sell their own homes for and their clients' homes for is actually closing down and has closed down by as much as a third already. Yeah, it's super important in any transaction, especially big ones like this and especially you know niche things where there are experts, you got to be really careful as to what sort of information is important in the transaction and understanding who has more information and hence power. And obviously, you want to get a bit of, bit of that power back for yourself. Mm. And if you're you know, the Machiavellian type and you've got information asymmetry, Ooh, yeah. you might as use well use advantage. it. And I use it in my profession. I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer and when I'm on site with the builders and the builders are interrogating a design or something like that, uh, there's an information asymmetry in some specific areas of design, especially when it comes to earthquake and wind loads and, mm. and all that because builders have got no idea about that. So when you just start talking about that, Everyone else will do sh- just shut up and <laughs> yeah, yeah, and just let you go. Yeah, and that's a big one is the fear side of the when you don't know. There's obviously you can build in a lot of fear there, which it sounds like you're you're using to your advantage. Yeah, like an axe. <laughs> so that's information asymmetry. The next thing is uh, correlation versus causation, and so the there's a massive, massive difference, and people often confuse the two, which is a bad thing. So correlation simply means that two things happen together at the same time, but causation means that one thing makes the other thing happen. So it's very important to distinguish the two. Firstly, distinguishing between do they just happen together or does one make the other? And also the other important thing is the direction. You know, just because A causes B doesn't mean that B causes A. So it's often you need to work out the direction of causation as well as if there is any causation whatsoever. And we always mix it up a lot. Uh, I'm going to steal an, uh, an example from Anti-Fragile here by Nassim Taleb. So he says, when you spend enough time on the bridge of a ship with a large compass in front, you can easily develop the impression that the compass is actually directing the ship rather than merely reflecting its direction. So obviously, when the ship moves, the compass is moving directly with it. Mm. So someone who's untrained, they will think, oh, shit, that compass is directing the ship and um, making it move and all that, but it's not. They're actually just correlated and there's no causation between the two. Yeah. Well, I suppose there's causation from the ship to the compass, but there's no causation yes. from the compass to the ship. Uh, another thing where I think there's correlation but no causation uh, is there was this study in 2007 uh, and uh, it, it's a bizarre one, but they measured the finger length and they measured the ratio of your ring finger to your index finger. And so they found that for males, if their ring finger 
was longer than their index finger, they were better at math. And if for, for females, if their ring finger was longer than their index finger, they had better verbal skills. So there's correlation there, perhaps, but there's no causation in the fact that if you sit home at every night and you stretch your ring finger and you eventually get it to be a little bit longer than your index finger just by stretching it and stretching it, that doesn't mean you're going to get better at maths. Yeah, well, never know. Have you tried it? <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't tried it whatsoever, but I'm calling bullshit on that one. Oh, mate, people stuff this up all the time. Like, it's, it's really big in sport. I was watching... I think you were... Yeah, we were both watching, yeah. actually. There was an AFL game on and... What they found was that I think it was like a Bruce McAvaney or someone like that was saying, "Oh, when when Carlton get twenty marks per quarter, they win every single game or something yeah. like that." Right? Mate, they had stats from the whole year, and that all their losses they had less than twenty marks a quarter, and all their wins they had more than twenty marks a quarter. So if you look at a bunch of statistics long enough, you're going to find some patterns, and they'll all of a sudden emerge, right? <laughs> and then like, oh, the first quarter they've had twenty three marks; they're looking good. They're going to win this game. <laughs> yeah. So what they obviously found was some correlation in a few different games, but yeah. there's there's not necessarily causation yeah. every time. <laughs> so some some uh, ridiculous statistics that you can pull and you might think that you've uncovered some magic secret and it looks perfect and it seems to line up with all the data, but it doesn't necessarily mean that one is causing the other. The story they use from the book is the drop in the US crime rate in the 1990s. So from mid-70s to the late 80s, the violent crimes had spiked 80%. So they were it's off amazing. the heezy and like, fuck... Everyone's just going out and shooting everyone. And then in the 90s, the crime rate mysteriously started to rapidly drop off. So all the intellectuals out there and all the smart people, they started just throwing out all these seemingly causal stories about why this was actually happening. Yeah, there was in all the academic research papers, they were assigning the, uh, assigning the benefit or the contribution to you know, innovative policing strategies, increased reliance on prisons, an aging population, changes in the drug markets, tougher gun laws, strong economy, the number of police. There's all these theories that everybody was pulling out and saying, this is the reason why crime's gone down. And they were all able to do these studies that you know, using the statistics proved that this was the case. But in most of these, there was correlation, but not necessarily direct causation. One of, we'll debunk a few of them. One of them was the innovative police strategies and the increased number of police. And you can probably guess who, you know, who the big advocates of these <laughs> ones, probably the police and the, the policy makers who are, uh, you know, responsible for all the police claiming all the credit. But if you actually dig into the numbers a little bit deeper, what you find is the number of police actually fell by 50% from 1960 to 85 relative to the number of crimes. Yeah, because what they found that, you know, in this period before the uh, drop-off in crime, when, there was, when the crime was increasing, they found that police numbers were going down. So 50% less police generally means that, you know, you're probably 50% less likely to be caught, which means there's probably less uh, in negative incentives there. So you're probably going to get away with some more crime more often because there are less police. So, you know, through to the mid-80s, they found that less police was in line with more crime. And what they found then was that in the 1990s, there was this massive blitz of hiring. They put a whole bunch more police on and they actually found that that did lead to a 10% drop in crime rate by having more police. So that was a definitely a positive one that seemed to work out. But one that didn't quite work out, but has been largely um, heralded as the, as the hero, is these innovative policing strategies. So in New York in the 1990s, they had this... Um, broken window theory they thought that okay we're going to get all the police to crack down on all of these minor issues because the, the idea here is that you know if you see a broken window it doesn't get fixed generally the the criminal might think okay we're in a dodgy neighborhood here people can get get away with more stuff and the cram the crime ramps up from there so what they decide to do they, they're going to crack down on graffiti they're going to crack down on fare evading people jumping the turnstiles in the subway public urination you know, the dudes on the street washing your windows, like they're going to crack down on all of these minor crimes. So then the criminals think, oh man, the police are so tough here, let's not fuck with them. But they found that that was a uh, complete BS. So the intellectuals who were whipping out on this big story, they were getting all worked out and thought it was working. So they f saw that homicide drop by 75% in the 1990s from 30.7 per 100,000 deaths down to 8.4 per 100,000. So on the surface, you think, all right, that's a it's working. pretty good one. Yeah. But again, the big um, team of Steves, they <laughs> dug a lot deeper and what they found was the homicide rate dropped by 20% from 90 to 93, 
but they actually initiated the strategies in 1994 onwards. Yeah, so it was already on the way down before they'd even started all these crazy new ideas. The second thing, new policing strategies were accompanied by a shitload of more police, which was already found to reduce crime rates crime rates in its own right. There was an increased number of police by 45%. Yeah, so as, as we, we, that already proved that more police means less crime. And so, you know, they brought in these innovative new strategies, but c- that came with also more police. And probably the biggest one is that, okay, in New York, there was all these benefits happening. But when they actually compared it to the rest of the US, the rest of the country, the whole country was going down. And so the whole country isn't impacted whatsoever by just the, these new innovative strategies that we're using in New York alone. So basically, they've, they've debunked this. Firstly, like crime was already dropping before they tried this. They had more police, which was already proven to work anyway. And then, you know, these... New York was actually no better off than the rest of the country that weren't trying these cool new things. So in Freakonomics, if you buy the book, you'll see them debunk all eight eight different causal explanations and all of them just get torn apart and and really don't explain the whole improvement when it comes to uh, the drop in the crime rates. So again, it's one of those things where you need to actually look for the hidden incentives in Mm. society where there might be actually second order effects the things that are outside of the the box kind of thinking. And interestingly, uh, one of the big ones that they found that seemed to perhaps have a massive impact that wasn't captured or wasn't mentioned in any of those academic studies previously was actually the advent of legalized abortion in the US. So, in 1973, the famous Roe versus Wade, uh, abortion was legalized across the whole US. And what they found was that Previously, the only people who were able to have abortions were, you know, wealthy people who could afford to get a, a dodgy doctor to do a, an illegal underground abortion. It was very expensive. And all of the lower class women weren't able to have abortions, meaning they were obviously having more children. When Roe versus Wade came in, they were able to afford cheaper legal abortions. And so previously, the people that weren't able to have abortions, they were saying were things like, you know, there were perhaps younger mothers, you know, maybe teenagers where it was an accident or maybe they were unmarried, maybe they were from low-income areas. All of these things that predicted that you weren't able to have an abortion were actually all the predictors that a child would grow up to be a criminal. So, by having this legalized abortion, there were less unwanted children and uh, the authors of Freakonomics were saying that, well, perhaps, you know, 18, 20 years after this became legalized, when all of these unwanted children would be growing up to be criminals, perhaps this had a big impact in the decrease in crime. So those changes came in 1973, where parents could all of a sudden uh, participate in legal abortions for only 100 bucks. So rather than having a kid as a teenager and really struggling financially to grow them up and love them from the very start and then having these unwanted kids become criminals uh, by the time they were 17 18 in the 90s they weren't actually there so you know mm. there's a whole immoral thing you might think around the whole idea of, of abortion but if we're just looking at only crime rates they actually found a very causal correlation here because they found that it was the same drop in crime by all the states at roughly the same time when they legalized abortion uh, in all the states who actually chose to have these these new regulations. Yeah, so it's probably a somewhat controversial one depending on um, what your view on abortion is. But statistically, they've, they, you know, they went and found all the, what are the main things that people are saying, which of these actually work and which of these don't, and what are some of the unexpected ones that might have a big impact as well. So in terms of linking it back to correlation versus causation, we like to attribute causality to things that we can sort of feel and touch and see and that are very present. We don't like to associate to something way in the distant past. Like say, for example, you know, abortion seems like a thing that was legalized 20 years ago. It doesn't seem like a massive thing compared to say, you know, these innovative policing strategies where the cops are cracking down on this, on the petty street crimes. So we might think that, okay, because it's we can see it, it's right now, it's very obvious, it's very clear, obviously the police are having a big impact. So that's what we like to assign causality to rather than something a bit more nebulous and a bit further away in the past. And it's really hard to predict what the second order effects of things are when you actually apply these new incentives. Like the, the regulators in 1973, what are the odds that they actually knew that they were going to help crime 
uh, down the track. Yeah, I'd say extremely um, low, yeah. So that's all about correlation versus causation. The next chapter in the book is all about uh, risk assessment and how us humans, we suck at risk assessment. <laughs> yeah, we like to think that we're um, you know, highly intelligent and we know everything that's going on and we rationally weigh things up and make an informed decision, but uh, very often we're, we're wrong. And they've got three examples here. The first one is, you know, take for example, there's a the parents, they've got an eight-year-old girl called Molly. She's got two friends, Amy and Sarah. They both live nearby, uh, but Amy's parents, they've got a gun in their house. So Molly is forbidden to go and play there because that's a very dangerous thing. But Sarah, uh, there's no gun, but they do have a pool in the backyard, but that's okay. That's a bit of fun. They're allowed to go and play there and they're allowed to go and swim in the pool. Mm, yeah, and that's, it's seemingly rational. If someone's got a gun versus the person with a pool, you think all the emotions that get triggered by someone with a gun and you think of your kid going out there to play with a gun versus yeah. jumping in the pool, you think, please go to your friend house with a yeah. pool and never <laughs> see that, that friend with a gun ever again. Yeah, and the parents think, oh, we've made a very smart decision here. We're protecting our daughter. But if you look at the stats... Each year, there is one child drowning for every 11,000 residential pools. Uh, but when you look at the, the guns, there's one child killed per every 1 million guns. So, you know, when the, in the US, there's 6 million pools, about 550 child drownings. That's one in 11,000. But there are, 200, there are 200 million guns and 175 deaths for kids under the age of 10. So we're talking about the difference in statistics here is one out of 11,000 versus one out of a million. So guns are you know, potentially 90 to 100 times safer than a backyard pool for an eight-year-old girl. Mm. And even, even hearing those statistics, you probably still won't tell it, go to a person <laughs> with a gun because we are just like naturally just terrible risk assessors and we won't even look at the statistics in this case. And it also happens when it comes to the idea of hopping on an airplane versus hopping on a car. So if you ask yourself what's actually more dr dangerous, driving or flying, and if you dig down into the statistics again, as you might expect, there's a lot more people each year who die in road accidents compared to uh, people in plane crashes. So there's 40,000 road deaths per year versus only 1,000 plane deaths. Yeah. So another area where we're really terrible at, at identifying risk is when it comes to health. And if you compare two things out there and risks of the way you might actually die is like say terrorism versus heart disease. So overwhelmingly, the comparison is not even close. I mean, the odds of you dying in a terrorist attack is pretty much zero compared mm. to coronary heart disease, which is really near the top. Mm. But if you open the newspaper um, on the Sunday morning and, you know, like my... Uh, my mum's boyfriend, Richard, great guy, a lot of respect for him, but he definitely falls in this category. So on a Sunday morning, you know, he might pull out the newspaper and have his morning coffee or his Bundy and Coke. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you open the newspaper and terrorism's on the front page of the news and you hear back the talkback radio, the terrorists and these all, all these other cultures coming in and uh, infiltrating Australian culture. You might think that um, if you buy into these, a lot of these ideas really occupy the brain for much longer and because they occupy the brain, there's an availability cascade where mm. the ideas of terrorism and these other cultures are much easier to access in your brain. So, you actually assign them a you know a much higher, higher risk even though it's irrational. Yeah, the government then spends so much money on the war on terror but disproportionately almost nothing you know, compared to the actual number of deaths. They're not like, there's no war in McDonald's or anything. Mate, I reckon there's a correlation, maybe even a cause, <laughs> maybe, probably not a causation, <laughs> probably a correlation between the people who should be caring more about coronary heart disease and McDonald's are probably the more the type of people who care about <laughs> terrorism so yeah. the fatter they are the more they're you know they're nationalist na nationalists as well all about you know the, the the country values and identity i think there's probably some correlation there we'd have to dig a bit deeper into the stats um but that's the thing like if there was if on the news every day you saw you know 10 minutes about all the hundreds of thousands of people who are dying from heart disease uh then that might become more uh more important in our minds but between all these three things, so the, the risk assessments of a gun versus a swimming pool, airplanes versus cars, terrorists versus heart disease, there's a few common things here as to what is really making us really bad at deciding what is worse for us. So one big one is control. 
So obviously we've got no control over terrorists, but we feel like we've got some control over ice creams. Or if you're driving a car, you feel like you're in control, but if you're flying as a passenger on a plane, you feel like you're relinquishing complete control to the pilot. So we feel like if we have some kind of control, it's safer. And that hence we uh, undervalue the amount of risk we assign to it. Whereas if it's out of our control, we think it's much more dangerous. So the, th- the second thing that makes us really irrational is the idea of the presence. So is the risk now or is it something that's kind of just abstract and in the future? Yeah. So the idea of a big bomb exploding when you walk into your car, it's the idea that, oh shit, it can happen actually now. But if you go out there and get that Macca's quarter pounder with cheese, it's kind of a ticking time bomb mm. that your heart might explode, you know, in 20 years time. So, you know, you're much more worried about the things that are ha- actually happening in the present. Yeah. And the third thing, so we've got control, we've got, we've got present. And then the third thing is uh, the idea of outrage. And so he says, you know, gruesome, dramatic, horrifying, outrageous things. These are things that we really uh, increase in terms of our risk. So obviously terrorism, it's got massive amount of outrage towards it, whereas heart disease doesn't. A gun killing a kid accidentally has got massive outrage, whereas you know drowning in a swimming pool, much less outrage. Same as like a, a horrifying, gruesome plane falling out of the sky mm. compared to someone who is a bit tired and, and just slipped off the road and one person hits, it, hits a tree, much less outrage around it. If we were rational human beings, we'd just look at the hazard and mm. look at that objectively and think, all right, you know, I'm going to have a, an apple instead of my quarter pounder with cheese. But yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Man, I want to get a quarter pounder after this. <laughs> Maybe not. So if we were rational human beings, we'd look at the hazard objectively and not be so influenced by outrage, but we're not very rational. So the outrage has a massive influence on how the, the way we assign risk. Mate, so those was, uh, that was free economics uh, and... What they've obviously done here is they've taken a whole bunch of the high academic side of you know, economics and how people respond to incentives and they've brought it down with a few real world examples and with a few studies into you know, how we can sort of take this and apply it to our own life, our decision making and what we do and why we do it. <laughs> <laughs>